Thanks a lot, Josh. I'll move back a little bit. Okay. If you're like me, have you ever noticed how certain apps on our computers or smartphones make our lives so much easier or sometimes even uh, save us time and money? I don't know about you, but one of the things that I enjoy most on our smartphone is maps. Because I'm one of those men who is blessed with no sense of direction. My wife has a good one, Matt has a good one, my daughter Christy is even worse than me. She even got lost once going up and down Highway 101. And I wasn't quite that bad, at least I knew north and south on the highway, but no sense of direction. But you know what? I don't need any more. I plug in where I'm going and that nice little gal just tells me how much longer I have to go, when to make my turns, right or left. And I've been using it now for seven, eight years, and uh, I think only once she got confused, but it was really nice. You know, it saves me a lot of time. In fact, I, I happen to love Dutch Brothers. Don't go too often, but uh, all of a sudden this last year they came out with an app, and I don't know if they do it anymore, but you put their app on your phone and you get a free large drink. See, it saves you money. So it, it's really neat to have something like that that saves us time and money and helps us with our lives. But today, I want you to know that the same is true for our spiritual lives. There's certain things that God wants us to download into our lives. Obviously, he doesn't call them apps, but that's basically what they are. Things he wants us to download into our lives that will make us more useful to him. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians 3. We're really only going to look at verses 11 through 17 today. But while you're turning there, let me give you some background. Colossians chapter 3. In the first eight verses, Paul tells the Colossian Christians there are certain things that should never be a part of their lives anymore. This is the way, he said, you used to live before you came to know Jesus Christ. But now that you're a follower of Christ, these things should absolutely not have any part in your life. And that's the negative aspect. And we don't want to look at the negative aspect today, but it'd be very, very good for you to read it because it's good for all of us to read it because we need to know. If these things are happening in our lives, we're not living the way God wants us to live. That's how non-Christians live. And then in verses 9 and 10, he makes a transition. So let's start with verse 9. Is there an app for that? Uh, yeah, there is. Just um, We'll give you that. Look at he says, since you've taken off your old self with his practices. Who's he talking to? And so this passage is definitely for those who are following Jesus Christ. You no longer live the old way. You've accepted Jesus Christ. And when you accept the Jesus Christ, what happens? Notice, you put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. See, God says, you get rid of something, but now what have you done? There's nothing there. You've put on something new. But notice this new thing that you've put on isn't complete the way it is. It's being renewed. And what it's telling us is that when we come to Jesus Christ and he forgives us, as someone during the prayer request time talked about the fact he takes all our sin, he takes all that old stuff that used to define who we were, it's all nailed to the cross. But that's not enough. He says it needs to be replaced, and it's replaced with something new he gives us. His Holy Spirit is given to live within us. But not in this passage, in other passages, it states what? When we accept this, we become like a baby. And that's why this one just takes for granted. It's being renewed. As God gives us this new life, now we need to grow up in this new life. And God doesn't want us to stay like babies. He wants us to mature, to become children, then teenagers, then young men and young women, and finally mature adults. And it's a lifelong process because that's what being renewed is. And how are we to be renewed? It says in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. The word used here for knowledge is one that meant a full knowledge. God wants us to understand everything. So what? We will be renewed to the image of our creator. Who's that? Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul said the same thing 
earlier in Romans chapter 8. He said, those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. See, God's will for you and me, for every one of us in this room, if we know Jesus Christ, is to become like him. But it's a lifelong process. And the more we increase in knowledge, well, how do we increase in knowledge? Well, it's by studying God's word. See, and in fact, I, I couldn't help but think of this. What should be our attitude towards God's word as believers? Isn't it what Peter said? He said, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. 1 Peter 2, verses 2 and 3. You think of a little baby. What do they do? They sleep and they eat. And if they're not getting any food, they yell and scream, don't they? They want that food. They want that milk. Here he says that's the way we should be in our Christian life. Do we really desire God's word in our life that way? Do we cry for it? Do we crave it? Because that's the only way we're ever going to grow up. That's the only way we're ever going to mature in our Christian life. And so now, in starting in verse 11, he talks about five different things. And there's obviously way more. In fact, one of these in particular, I, you could probably preach 10 sermons on just the one point. But there's five different things that God desires in every one of his children. It doesn't make any difference what our responsibilities are, what our calling in life is, whether it's to be a pastor or a janitor, it makes no difference. These five things God wants in every person's life. And what I'd urge you to do this morning, and it's what I do as I read God's word, if I read something that I know I am doing well, I ask God to help me to do it even better. And you see that in many portions of scripture. There's one church that God says, you're known for your love and my prayer is that you abound in more love. So if you're doing it, great, keep doing it. But my guess is for every one of us as we go through these things, there are gonna be some things we're gonna say, ooh, I'm not doing quite so well in that. And what I'd ask you to do is anytime you look into the mirror and God shows you something, Ask God for help to start changing that area. Because that's what this whole passage is about. You and I are being renewed in Christ's image. It's a lifelong process. How am I doing? So the first app that God wants us to download is what I call the People app. You find it in verse 11. It's a verse that a lot of people just skip over in the Bible and have no clue what it means, but it's very, very important. Notice what it says. Here... There is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. What Paul's talking about here is the way we view other people, believe it or not. When he says Greek or Jew, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about racial differences. I mean, I, I swear sometimes when you watch the news, you'd think that uh, prejudice was just invented in the last hundred years. Let me tell you, to really truly understand scripture, you have to understand if there is ever prejudice, it was back in this day. The Jews and the Greeks hated each other. That's why the new church had so much problems because the Jewish believers couldn't believe that, that Gentiles could be saved. And all of a sudden, you had two groups of people forming a new thing called the church and they hated each other's guts. The Jews called the Gentiles dogs. The Gentiles called the, Greek, the Jews even worse. And these hatreds were there. But what is Paul saying? In the body of Christ, there's no room for racial hatred, period. There is no room for it. Circumcised or uncircumcised, what's he talking about here? Believe it or not, he's talking about religious rituals. And people back in those days, just like today, and it's, I don't think it's quite as strong today as it was at one time. But certain people say, if you don't do it this way, you're not doing it right. You're awful. There's some churches that have communion every Sunday. And they say those churches who don't have communion every Sunday are horrible. I think of this all the time because I love, I love bands. When I was going up, you know what they said, Josh? Drums are the devil's instrument. I'm serious. When I was growing up... There were no drums in church, and the few churches that had them, those were satanic churches. They were calling out the demons because they played drums. 
they forgot to read Psalms. It says, praise him with all musical instruments. But see, people do that. They start judging you on religious practices. Now, listen carefully. I'm not talking about heresies, but religious practices. How do you do it? There's some people that think the baptize inside is horrible. You always should baptize outside. I mean, I could go on for hours on the different religious differences, and some people take these differences in practices to the point where they will have nothing to do with someone who makes a different practice than them. It's sickening to God, and it shows these people have never grown up. See, that's what it's talking about there. Then he says, barbarian or Scythian. Well, here he's talking about cultural differences. And we know that every culture has its differences. You and I, it's not saying that we have to like differences of other cultures, but it is saying that if you and I allow cultural differences to affect the way we treat people, then you and I are sinning. Because in God's body, there's none of this. And then he says slave or free. Here he's talking about class, social differences. The rich, the poor, the mighty, the powerful, the weak. See, none of this is to have part of God's body. Why? And the reason is given in the last part of the verse. Look what it says. Why are all of these things wrong? It says Christ is all and is what? In all. Now remember, we're talking about the family of God here. But what it's saying is, if someone has accepted Christ, who lives in their life? Christ. If you've accepted Christ, who lives in your life? Christ. If Christ is in all, and if Christ is all, the only thing that matters, then none of these differences can exist. In fact, Christ himself has obliterated these words in his family, and you know what Christ says about the family of God? He says we're brothers and sisters. We're brothers and sisters, regardless of our race, regardless of our religious practices, regardless of our culture, regardless of our social standing. And when you and I really, truly understand this, we cannot allow prejudice to exist in our life. And there have been churches that have practiced prejudice, and I don't know what they're going to do on the Day of Judgment. Do you remember what... John wrote in 1 John 4, just listen to these words. It's 1 John 4, 20 if you want to look it up later. But John said, if anyone says I love God yet hates his brother, he is a liar. Anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen, listen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. When you and I refuse to accept and love a brother or a sister in Christ, whether it be because of the color of the skin or any of these other things. God says, you don't love me. I'm not saying that. God says it. But we better pay attention to that because when God says something that strong, what it means is there's going to be a whole lot of people. Remember on the Day of Judgment when Jesus says there's going to be a lot of people that come before me and you're going to say, oh, Lord, Lord. They weren't the ones who were saying there, were no, there was no God. They're not the people he's talking about here that says, I don't care what God says, I'm going to party hardy. These are people who went to church. These are people who called him Lord. And he says, there's going to be a lot of people on the day of judgment who are going to say, Lord, and God's going to say what? Go away from me. You never knew me. You never knew me. And here's one of the reasons. One of many. If we say we love God whom we haven't seen, but we don't love somebody we can see, God says we're a liar. In fact, in another place in John, he writes, then the truth is not in us. See, do I need to download the people app? Do I see brothers and sisters in Christ for who they are, my brother and sisters, or do I treat them differently because of one of these four reasons? If I do, I need to get my heart right with God because it's wrong. Now, again, you preach a whole sermon on this, but that's just one point, so let's move on. The next is our character app. Now, this one... I'm going to give you a bunch of definitions. Hopefully, it'll be a little fast because, again, you could preach a sermon on every one of these character qualities. But in the next two verses, 
Paul tells us something that's very, very important that is seen in each one of our lives. So let's look at it. Verses 12 and 13. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with what? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, like I said, we're just going to go over these briefly. I'm just going to give you definitions. But if you really like to study God's word, you should take each of these words, look it up in a concordance, and look up each passage that uses these words. Because God says, this is what should define every one of my children's character. And then I need to look in the mirror and say, if you asked someone else about me, would they say these things are true? See, what is it that God wants us to clothe ourselves with? We've stripped off the old. We've put on the new. Well, what's the new look like? First of all, it's compassion. Some people are really easy. For other people, it's really hard. Compassion is nothing more or less than having a tender heart. It means we care about other people. For some of you, it may be a really easy thing. For other people, it may be a real hard thing. But even if it's a hard thing, it's something God wants to develop in you and me. Am I a person of compassion? The second word is kindness. Kindness is a little different than compassion. It actually comes from the word for grace in the Bible, which means I treat other people not based on what they deserve, but based on what they need, just like God does with us. See, I show them God's grace. I treat them nice. And again, I hope you get this. For most of us, but they don't deserve it. Do you know what they say? Do you know what they do? Do you know how they live? They don't deserve it. God says it's not based on what they deserve. That's how grace is. If God gave us what we deserved, we'd all be going to hell. Because none of us deserve heaven. But God grace through faith saves us, doesn't it? He gives us that undeserved favor. And here it's talking to us and it's saying, we need to be people that show this grace, show this kindness to others. The next word is humility. And again, this one easily could take a whole sermon. And I'm going to just try to highlight a couple things to help you understand this because most of us misunderstand humility. Humility is an attitude. An attitude towards yourself and an attitude towards others. As far as towards ourself, humility means I look at myself clearly. I know what God has gifted me in. I know what I'm good in and what I'm bad in. I know I'm not good in everything. Humility is not telling a lie. I'll pick on Josh because I know I can. If Josh were to stand up here and say, okay, God wants me to be humble. I am just a lousy musician. You know, I, I can't do a thing. Is he being humble? No, he's telling a lie. God's gifted him musically, and that's why I'm using it. See, it's not saying that. It's, it's the same as uh, Paul teaches the Romans in Romans 12. Look at yourself with sober judgment, judgment. What has God gifted me in? What am I good in? What am I bad in? Now, I can honestly say up here in humility, I'm lousy at music, and it's the truth, <laughs> because I am. See, but to say, well, I, I'm lousy at teaching God's word. No, it may not be the best, but I love teaching God's word. See, people think just because you're a preacher, you're a good public speaker. I'd never be a good public speaker. Believe it or not, if I'm not talking about God's word to stand up and talk in front of people, I'd be as scared to death as most of you are. When I'm teaching God's word, I'm not scared at all. I love teaching God's word because I know it's God's word. It's his authority. See, so humility is looking at yourself and saying, I know what I'm good at, but I know I'm not always good. So what does that mean? It means when I view other people, I understand that God also has made them really good in some areas, as well as not good in other areas. Well, if I really believe that, do you know what that means? It means I listen. (laughs) I listen, and I understand that I can learn from them. I know God has given them gifts, just like he's given me gifts. I know, from reading scripture, that I need their gifts in my life, just as they need my gifts in their life. That's what humility is. 
It's understanding and treating each other, listening to each other, getting along together in that way. See, do I really understand that? Do I know where God has gifted me? Do I know where God has made me strong? Do I know where I'm weak? Do I recognize that in my brothers and sisters? And do I listen to my brothers and sisters and work with my brothers and sisters to have input into my life from them? Because I need that. See, and that's what it's all about. Like I said, go to a whole sermon on that. What's the next one? Gentleness. Now, a lot of people misunderstand the word gentle. Believe it or not, this, verse in, this word in Scripture really means strength that's under control. And when it's used for believers, it means my physical body strength and abilities under God's control. It was actually used of great thoroughbred horses. A horse that could be controlled by the jockey was very gentle because it could be controlled and it meant it would be a good racing horse. God says, do you and I offer our bodies to God and say, God, here's my body, your strength now to be seen through me. You work through me. You do what you want to do through me. Because, see, that's what God wants from every one of us, and that's what gentleness is all about. I'm more concerned with others than myself, and I want God to work through me. The word patience, again, <laughs> How many times that's talked about in Scripture? This particular one is from two Greek words, one which means long and the other which means temper. It doesn't mean that you keep your temper for a long time. It means you have a long fuse on your temper. It's like a stick of dynamite, but instead of a three or four inch fuse, it has a 20 foot fuse. So when that fuse is lit and I do get hot, which happens to all of us, I think about it. I say, what would Jesus do? Hopefully, I'm studying scripture enough that I know what he would do instead of just taking a wild guess. And I say, you know what I know what Jesus would do? He would stomp out this fuse right here. <laughs> and if I have a long enough fuse, I have plenty of time to stomp on it before it goes off. And that's the way God says he wants all of us to be, with his help, with his help. And I can give you story after story on that. I, my, my favorite is a guy that had a four-by-four four section in his backyard, fenced off, Nobody in his family was allowed to go in this area, and the only thing in this area was a shovel. And his wife and his children knew that when he said, I have to go dig, they didn't say a word. They let him go dig. And he just came up with this on his own because he knew he was a man with a hot temper. And every time he felt that temper rising within him, he would go out there and dig. And how long he had to dig, it just kind of kept on. Okay, what happens if I do what I'm thinking about doing what I want to do? What's going to happen if I say the words I think I'm going to say? And he would actually just go out there and dig until he was fine, and then he'd come back in. I don't know what you have to do. I've never forgotten that guy. But he understood what God was saying here. A long fuse on your temper. A long fuse on your temper. The next one, bear with others. You know what that means? <laughs> it means to get along with difficult people. Now, we hear that, but sometimes we forget what that really means. It means in every church, are there going to be difficult people? Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's always somebody else, never us, but there are difficult people in every church, and we're going to come across them. Do we just get to write them off? God says no. God says we need to get along even with difficult people. And then lastly... Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And it's interesting, there's different words for forgive in the New Testament. This one is actually not the usual word, which means to send something away. This is from the word for grace. And the idea of this kind of forgiveness, it's also used of God with us, but it means it's unconditional. It means I give up every right to hold a grudge. I give up every right to get even with someone who has hurt me. I give up the right to become bitter towards someone who sinned against me. See, why do we have these verses? Because even in the body of Christ, even when we want to follow Christ, we sin, don't we? Sometimes our sin is private and nobody knows about it. But sometimes our sins aren't private. Sometimes we sin against someone. 
and God gives us the, the way to take care of those sins. But here, what God says is, we need to forgive a brother or sister when they forgive, when they sin against us. And to understand how important this is, remember in Matthew 6 when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, and you know the Lord's Prayer. Do you realize that after that prayer, he only repeats one part of the prayer? And the only part he repeats is on forgiveness. If you want to look it up later, it's Matthew 6, 14 and 15, but I'll read it for you. Listen to what he says. If you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Isn't that what we want? But listen to what Jesus says. This is not me. This is Jesus. If you do not forgive people their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, I don't know about you, but I can tell you this. I am not good enough that I can afford for God not to forgive me. And I want you to know this is something God taught me early in life, and I can honestly say this is one of those things I've mastered. There's not anyone in my life I haven't forgiven. Not because sometimes I wanted to forgive them, but because I know if I don't forgive them, God's not going to forgive me. I can't live without God's forgiveness. Therefore, I find it actually very easy to forgive others because I know I'm not that good. Here's what I hope. I hope you know you're not that good either. <laughs> if you really understand this verse, if you want God's forgiveness, you have to forgive others. You have to forgive others. But now notice, like I said, every one of these I just mentioned could be a sermon in themselves. And are they important? Yes. But look at how he ends it in verse 14. But above all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. He says, as good as all of these things are, love is the essence, the essence of every one of these qualities. It, it's, it's love that binds them together. And the idea of perfect unity here is completeness, maturity. It's love that binds them together. See, we need something like that in our life. I couldn't help but think at, at Christmas, we have a, a, a big uh, nativity scene with, with big animals and statues and stuff. And, and one of the donkeys got knocked over and the ears broke off. Fortunately, it was just a nice clean break. I stood it back up and I set the ear on there. Well, it, it even stayed on by itself. But was it fixed? No. No, if you, if you just jiggled it, it would fall right off. So I, I, I fixed it the way any good grandpa would fix it. Got up my Gorilla Glue, and you know what? It stays on now. Because the Gorilla Glue made it so it stayed, even though it looked like it was on there, just sitting it there. In essence, what God is saying here, love is our Gorilla Glue that holds all these characters together, characteristics together. It's love. That's why he said, the greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But you notice every one of these commands on our character have to do with other people. What's the royal law? What's the second greatest command? To love others as ourself. He says, love is the glue that holds all these together. See, if people are in Christ's family, we need to love them like Christ does because they're our brothers and sisters. If people are not in God's family, we need to love them as Christ does. He was willing to die for them so that they might find the Father and find the kingdom. That should be our attitude as well. Now just a few last apps. Verse 15, first part. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace. Here I call it the unity app. What does God want in his church family? He wants unity. Let the peace of God rule. Peace, if you see it in scripture many, 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 many times, always remember, peace has two components to it. One is the absence of conflict, and we all like that, and we understand that. But peace also has a, a, a positive, active element to it, and that means harmony. Harmony, something that goes together. If you're like me, uh, some musicians like discord and uh, it makes my body shiver. But if you're like me, beautiful harmonies just sound so wonderful together. And that's what this piece is. And here, what is Christ saying to the church? I want harmony in my body. Remember when he's in the upper room with his disciples 
and he prayed that night right before he went to Gethsemane and to the cross. He said in that prayer in John 17, verses 20 and 21, he says, Father, as I'm praying, my prayer is not just for my disciples alone right here in front of me, but I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, which means you and me, every Christian that's become a follower of Christ since the disciples. What is this prayer? That all of them may be one. Father, just as you're in me and I'm in you, may they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. What is Christ's prayer? I want my followers to be one because when people in the world around see them as one, they'll know you sent me. Now, why is that? Because people in the world know exactly what you and I know. Some people are difficult to get along with. We have a variety of opinions. If we were to ask everybody in this room, what's your opinion on, let's get new carpet, what colored carpet should we get? Or let's paint the walls, what color should we paint the walls? I bet you we wouldn't get just one opinion. I would bet every cent I have in my retirement, we'd get all kinds of opinions. Most of the time when people in the world disagree, they get mad at each other and they don't talk to each other. In fact, I don't think anything's ever gotten worse than it is in our country right now. It's like, if we don't agree, then we can't like each other. And I've never understood that, but a lot of people disagree. But see, this is the whole point. In the body of Christ, we need to learn to get along together. See, the word rule here is actually the word which meant an umpire, a referee. They're the ones who make the final decision. What should make the final decision when there's disagreement? The peace of grace. The peace of Christ. What can we do? How can we work through this situation to bring about peace? Harmony. Lack of discord. See, and part of that is, and we don't want to hear this, but part of that is, am I only fighting for what satisfies me, or am I willing to listen to others and come to a mutual decision, even though it may not be the one I would have personally chosen? But I understand it's not that big a deal that peace is way more important. And again, please understand carefully, I'm not talking about heresy here. We're not talking about somebody's view on the Bible that's just totally askew. But most of the things, and if you study church splits over the years, you'd be surprised, but the majority of church splits haven't come over theology. They've come over crazy, stupid things. Chairs, pews, carpet, no carpet, drums, no drums. I mean, I mean, when you read some of the church splits over the years, it is absolutely asinine that children of God could actually do this type of thing. But they missed the whole point, the unity. Christ says he wants us to be one. What can we do to be one? Okay, two last apps. The next one won't spend much time on because you know this. None of this is going to happen unless this is part of your life, but I call it just the Bible app. What does he say in verse 16? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word dwell here means to be at home. To be at home. Think about this. I assume that most of you are like me, but maybe not. But have we ever been in a, in a situation around a bunch of people where we really felt uncomfortable? <laughs> Couldn't wait to get out of there because it's just, it just wasn't our thing? See, what this is saying is, we know that feeling. It's not talking about you and me here. What is it talking about? The Word of God. It's saying, is the Word of God comfortable at home in me? See, sometimes we ask ourselves, what would you do if Jesus was standing right there? Well, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he is standing right there. He's in your life. He's there when nobody else is around. He's there when you're in the dark. He's there when you're all alone. He knows everything that we say, do, watch, read, and everything else. He's always with us. See, and, and, and what this is saying is, is the word at home in our life? Really, what the issue here is, and what it's saying to you and me is, are you and I giving the Bible unrestricted authority in our lives? God, when I look in that mirror, if you point something out to me, I will obey. I will change. I will do whatever you show me. Or am I, like so many people, that's nice, God. Nice that you believe it. 
but I know I'm a little smarter than you, and so I'm going to do this. Most of the time we don't have the guts to say that to God, but that's what we say by our lifestyle. You say it, but I'm going to do what I want to do. The problem is, those people have no assurance that they're in God's family, because God says, my children listen to me. My children do what I say. The truth is there. They will obey it. That's what a child of God does. See, and how do they do it here? As the word of God dwells in them. I love this. They teach and admonish one another in wisdom. We help other people learn what we've learned. We warn other people as we've been warned to say, this is the way God says to live. We need to live this way. We need to obey him. We need to listen to him. But do you see how they do it here? A lot of people have missed this. But the early church used psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to do this teaching. I mean, they, they had teachers as well, just like you have a pastor. But they used their music to do this. And, and I think I really know why. Have you ever noticed, even people who say they can't memorize a thing for a test at school or anything else, but you put on your favorite song on the radio and you can sing every word? Did you ever sit down and say, I want to memorize the words of that song? No. It's just... You like the music, you like the song, and you listen to it three or four hundred times, and you know what? You can, you can sing right along with them every word. Music is a powerful teacher. And here, a lot of people try to make a big deal over psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. I don't think the writer here had any big preference here. I don't think he's trying to distinguish them, but if you want to know what they are, psalms were psalms set to music. So when you see the word psalms, they had musical accompaniment. Hymns did not, believe it or not. You know, some of you are older and you like the old hymn books and you don't like the new choruses or whatever. It's not talking about those kind of hymns. Hymns were basically praises to God that were chants. You've heard of the Gregorian chants probably, if you haven't. They had chants that they would just actually chant to God. Spiritual songs were just songs, not particularly scripture. It could be other scriptures, but they were songs of spiritual truth. And it could have music and it could not have music. And as I said, I don't think he's making any big deal here. I don't think he's even trying to say you need all three of these. And No, he's just saying this is what the early church did, and this is how they helped each other. They would chant these things to God. They would sing the word of God back to him, and it became a part of their lives. The Bible has to be centered because the Bible tells us how to live. And then the very last thing here, and we close with this, is the thankfulness app. If you're really following along, you notice that I, I, I skipped it. And in the last part of, uh, I think it was verse uh, uh, 15, it said, and be thankful. And then in the last part of 16 and 17, it says, with gratitude in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thankfulness. See, I think we get the idea. Verse 15 is emphasizing that thankfulness should be continuous, that we should be thankful at all times. Paul teaches the same thing in 1 Thessalonians. Verse 16 actually uses the word grace there when it's translated gratitude or thankfulness. But what are we to be thankful for? See, we're to be thankful for everything God does. See, everything. See, look, at whatever you do, whether in word or deed, whatever you do, talking or in actions, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. See, what I need to understand here is we are representing Christ to the world around us. And we do it by the way we treat each other. We do it by the words that come out of our mouth. We do it by the actions that we do. And we're thankful. See, do we get the picture? It's hard sometimes. We say, well, yeah, but I've had some difficult things come into my life. I'm still thankful. Why? Because God's with me. We're never thankful when someone's dying because we want them with us. Yet we can be thankful that God is with us in that situation and he will meet every need just as Don and Jim and the rest of the family is finding out. Because God doesn't leave us or forsake us. He walks us through that path. We're not thankful when there's an accident or something else. But you know what? God is with us. He's not going to leave us. He's going to walk us, hold our hands. He'll pick us up and carry us if necessary, just like the shepherd did with the sheep. See, this is who God is. So whether the opportunities that come into our life are positive or negative, 
we know that God allowed him to come into our life because he wants to show the world what he's like through us. And the biggest thing that will show it is our attitude. Am I really thankful to God? Am I really thankful to God? So just as we close, let me just kind of review those five different apps, for lack of a better word today. Is there one where I really need to work? Is there one where if I'm honest, when I look in the mirror, I'm really failing? How about the ability to see other people the way Jesus sees them, the people app? Do I fight prejudice in my life? If so, I need to get rid of it. I need to get rid of it because Christ is in all and he is all. How about those character qualities? My guess is if we're honest, some of them we do pretty well, some we don't. That's the way it usually works out. But on the ones that we don't, are we willing to say, God, help me to develop this in my life? How about the unity app, getting along with others? Is that one I'm really good at? Or am I really kind of selfish? I'm always fighting for my own way, and if I don't get my own way, I'm just going to stop my foot and walk out. What kind of a person am I? God says, I want you to be unified. How about the Bible app? Do I spend time in God's word every day? Or is the only time I hear God's word on Sunday? Or if I come on Wednesday night? You know, God says, you're my son, my daughter. I want to talk to you every day. You need to listen to me. See, most of us are really good at praying. We want to tell God how to, how to run things. But how much time do we spend in the word listening to God and let him talk to us and tell us how it ought to be done? And then the last one, how thankful am I? Am I a thankful person or not? You know the answer, I know the answer. God knows the answer. Do I need to change? Let's thank God for this word. Thank you for teaching us, Father. Just help us now to be honest, to be willing to let your spirit teach us what areas we need to improve in so that we will represent you well to the world around us. Thank you again for this time together today, and may your spirit now use us this week to represent you well to the world. May they see us as they understand what Christ is like because they can actually see him through us by the things we say and do. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. And you're dismissed.